What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. I hope you enjoyed last week's episode on Jerry Michael Williams. Today we are talking about someone who came from nothing and he won everything, and it actually made his life much, much worse. That man is Abraham Shakespeare. And without waiting too much longer, let's get right into this episode. Abraham Shakespeare was 42 years old and had lived in Lakeland, Florida all of his life. He only completed his schooling up to seventh grade. Abraham was functionally illiterate and could neither read nor write. Owing partly to his lack of education, Abraham was poor and had been poor his whole life. But he had a very strong work ethic, working three low-paying jobs, and he was a kind man, the type that would go out of his way to help others. And he seemed pretty content with life, happy even. Like many who have lived long in deep poverty, Abraham wished that things would get better for him financially. Until then, he'd keep his head down and get on with things. And just to help chance along, once in a while, he played the lotto. On November 15th, 2006, heading home from his job as a delivery assistant, he and his colleague Michael Ford stopped at a convenience store. He asked Michael, whom Abraham considered a friend, to pick him up two tickets for that evening's lotto drawing that was worth $30 million. He gave him $2 for the tickets. It was a pretty small price to pay for a few hours of hope. And at the time this happened, Abraham was said to only have had $5 to his name. He was excited to watch the numbers later that night. It turned out to be Abraham's lucky day, and as it happened, one of his last happy days. He hit all six numbers and was the sole winner of $30 million. Now, the Florida lottery system gives a winner a choice to take a smaller sum up front or to spread out the winnings over several decades, I think about 20 years. Abraham decided to take the $17 million lump sum instead of stretching out the payments over, yeah, 20 years. Everyone dreams of not having to work if they win the lottery and Abraham was no different. He originally took some time off from his janitorial job cleaning up at a local barber shop, which was owned by his friend Greg Smith. And actually, Greg didn't know what was up. It was unlike Abraham to not show up, and he just wasn't showing up. And then he gave him a call, and Abraham basically said, hey, I won the lottery, and Greg didn't believe him until Abraham showed up in a brand new black BMW. On top of the black BMW, Abraham bought a million dollar house in Lakeland, this was an amazing house, something Abraham could only have dreamed about. It would come out later, though, that the real estate agent he worked with overpriced the home, and when the official appraisal had been done, it was worth $400,000 less than what he paid. And I think you'll notice, sort of, this will become a common occurrence in his life from here on out. Basically, people coming out of the woodwork in every direction, trying to take advantage of him. But even with his new riches, Abraham enjoyed his work. And he did something that not very many people would ever do if they won $17 million, and he returned to his job in due course. Having only ever been in poverty, Abraham had a strong work ethic, something he needed to survive. And winning the lottery didn't change that. It would take more than a single windfall to change the thinking and habits of a lifetime, when worry has a chance to put down deep roots. Abraham would still pick up pennies found laying on the ground, telling the barbershop patrons who teased him that pennies made dollars. So basically, Abraham would pick up pennies saying, these make dollars, man. And they would, they would actually kind of make fun of him. But when you're poor, you don't walk by money that comes your way, no matter the denomination. And, you know, even with people trying to get a piece of the pie from very early on, things were pretty nice for a while. He met a woman by the name of Centoria Butler, and she would become pregnant. Even though things were looking okay for now, Abraham would eventually start sleeping with other women, and while he tried to keep the secret from Centoria, he failed at doing so, and eventually they would end their relationship. Abraham would continue to buy some things, and he loved spending on others, actually. He loved spending on others even more than himself. And when everyone that he'd ever known came to ask for loans, it's like he can never say no. He paid off his mother's mortgage and delighted in making things easier for his mom. He gave away money to strangers in need. He would help any friend who asked. And in time, he would pay off the mortgages of 10 other people. And although he held IOUs for those notes, he thought he would supposedly be paid back eventually. But, you know, the thing is, is once he started going back to those people for payments, of course, they started dodging him. And again, you know, he was just a pretty generous person. And despite his lack of formal education, he had street smarts. He knew he wasn't equipped to manage his fortune and would often follow his heart instead of sound business practices when making decisions. He just couldn't look someone in the eyes and say no because he knew what it meant to be poor. He enjoyed using his wealth to make people happy. And in fact, it quickly became the only thing about his winnings that brought him joy. 
Abraham owed the IRS millions in taxes. He was late on his mortgage payments, and while he was rich in assets, by 2008, he was down to just $1.5 million. He needed help, and he knew it. But there wasn't anyone in Abraham's life who knew anything about managing wealth. No one he could trust, and he had become increasingly skeptical and wary as he was taken advantage of time and time again. He told his mother that winning the lottery was the worst thing that ever happened to him, and that he wished he could return to his old life. Abraham wasn't stupid. People mistook his simple, happy nature for being so. He knew people were taking advantage of him, and he also knew that regardless of his situation, he would help out anyone that asked, so it saddened him when people he considered his friends were treating him like this. His friend, Michael Ford, initiated a lawsuit against Abraham, claiming that he was the rightful owner of the winning ticket. Michael claimed that Abraham never actually paid for the ticket, but that he stole the tickets from Michael. Supposedly, Abraham stole the tickets from Michael's wallet in his truck, and he even said that Abraham told Michael that he did indeed steal it, but later in trial, five witnesses would come forward and say that Michael told them that he did purchase the tickets for Abraham. A jury would eventually side with Abraham. Centoria Butler, his ex-girlfriend and mother of his son, was seeking back child support, and this makes sense. Old co-workers and neighbors were beating a path to his door with a sad story and a handout. Abraham would pay for funerals, groceries, fines, rent, school tuition, you name it. It was during this time of increasing emotional turbulence and financial stress that a true predator would set its sight on Abraham's fortune. Doris Moore, nicknamed Dee Dee, was a divorced, middle-aged mom of two boys. She claimed to be a lot of things, such as an author and an owner of an agency that provided in-home assistance to many seniors. But other than the two kids, there wasn't much in the way of tangible proof to back up her resume. Yes, she was an author, and while the manuscript hadn't been published per se, she was quick to point out that she had a copyright for it, although getting a copyright for something like that is pretty easy. But perhaps that sounded impressive to Abraham. It was under the guise of an author that D.D. Moore would wedge her way into Abraham's life. She wanted to write a book about him and his life. She arranged for Abraham's real estate broker to introduce them, but like most sociopaths, Dee Dee had a superficial charm that she used to manipulate people in situations to her advantage, often to their peril. If Dee Dee was going to write about Abraham's incredible life, she would need to live nearby. So Abraham bought a home for Dee Dee and her children in addition to a new car. Dee Dee was quick to offer financial advice, even assistance, to Abraham when she was learning of his dwindling financial situation. One month, she paid his $7,000 mortgage payment to prove that she could be trusted and that she had his best interest at heart. But Dee Dee knew that if she didn't act quickly, there would be no money left. The long game of writing a book while she was quietly siphoning off money probably wasn't going to work. I mean, by the time it could, there would be no money left to steal. And Dee Dee didn't just want a piece of it. She wanted it all. She claimed that her staffing agency had made her a wealthy woman, and she dressed the part of a successful professional driving an expensive car that I'm sure Abraham paid for, but she canceled Abraham on his financial dealings and planned to write about the shameful way he had been taken advantage of in the book. She nominated herself to be a financial advisor, and she wanted to help him out of his financial difficulties. To free up some ready cash for Abraham to get the IRS off his back, she bought the many IOUs Abraham had accrued so she herself could collect the cash owed on them. Dee Dee put her financial acumen at his disposal and offered to be the go-between during Abraham's interactions with the IRS. Abraham wasn't going to be alive long enough to discover the deception, unfortunately. Centoria Butler knew of Abraham's learning disabilities, especially his trouble understanding complex financial concepts. But she wasn't looking to take advantage. She simply wanted the money she was owed in child support, money that Dee Dee now saw as hers. She devised a scam that would have Abraham put his assets into her name, telling him it was for his own protection. But you know, Dee Dee is a con artist, with a long history of fraud and embezzlement, both proven and suspected. She is alleged to have set fire to disrupt an embezzlement investigation. Another time, after falling behind on her car payments, she tied herself up, laid down in a ditch, and she cried that she had been carjacked and assaulted, left for dead on the side of the road. Dee Dee was hoping for an insurance payout in addition to keeping the car, she wound up pleading guilty to making a false police report and was sentenced to a year of probation. She was a truly dangerous predator with a long trail of victims in her wake. But Dee Dee didn't see it that way. Her narcissism is her Achilles heel, and like many of her ilk, she'd rely on her lies and the belief that she was smarter than everyone else to shield her from the consequences of her actions. Dee Dee was able to convince Abraham that both the IRS and Centoria Butler were scheming to take his money. 
DD created a limited liability partnership called Abraham Shakespeare LLC and opened an account at the local Bank of America branch. DD moved almost a million dollars out of annuity into the new account, over which she eventually gained sole signing authority after forging documents to remove Abraham from the account. Abraham gives DD a cashier's check for a quarter of a million dollars intended for the IRS. She makes a token payment of $20,000 to the IRS and pockets the remainder. She then buys his home for $650,000, telling him it's just temporary. By mid-2009, Abraham's account shows a balance of just under $40,000. Dee Dee Moore tries bribing the Bank of America bank manager with a check for $20,000 to keep Abraham in the dark. But the bank manager turns her into the authorities, who begin an investigation, and Dee Dee panics. Abraham doesn't learn of the deception, though, because Abraham himself has disappeared. Friends and family become concerned when the sociable Abraham doesn't turn up to parties and social engagements. He doesn't show up for work, and he just, he's just gone one day. Dee Dee is telling Abraham's friends and family that he's gone away, that he's tired of people always asking him for money, uh, so he went on vacation. She tells him that he's gone to different places, and it seems like maybe she's having a hard time keeping the same story for different people. Dee Dee, however, is living large. She would claim it's just one of life's funny coincidences that showers her with financial good fortune just when Abraham goes missing. She appears unable to control the greed that's driving her, and she indulges in an epic spending spree, buying herself a new Hummer, a pickup truck, and a $70,000 Corvette for her new young boyfriend. And she's living in Abraham's mansion and buys a second house for good measure. Eventually, one of Abraham's cousins files a missing persons report for Abraham, and an investigation is underway. All while, there is also an active investigation into her management of Abraham's money. So it's safe to say that things are not looking good for Dee Dee. The investigators know that she is hiding something, and she starts to realize this. So Dee Dee goes to Greg Smith, a close friend of Abraham's, and remember the owner of the barbershop that Abraham worked at. She asks Greg for a favor. She wants Greg to call Abraham's mom, pretend to be Abraham, and tell her that he is okay. And at first, he's apprehensive about this, as you think that he should be but she offers him a whole sum of $300 to do it. And in need of money, he agrees. So Dee Dee takes Abraham's mother to a loud restaurant, out for dinner, I guess to sort of talk about, you know, how bad it is that Abraham's missing. Greg calls during this time, and Dee Dee encourages her to answer the call because it could be her son. Greg tells Abraham's mother that he is okay, pretending of course, and not to worry, and that he'll be back soon. It appears that at the time, she bought this. Now I know what you're thinking. What the hell, Greg? But in future interviews with Greg, he says that at first, he really did believe that maybe Abraham was gone, and that Dee Dee really did want people to get off her back. However, he starts to get suspicious, as he should, and called Abraham's phone and left a voicemail, telling him to call him back. Then he got a text. A text from a man who can't read, spell, or write. Remember, Abraham is literate, and he never texts. So obviously, this raises some suspicions in Greg's mind, and investigators witness Dee Dee giving the $300 to Greg, and they take him in. Now, they inform him that there is an investigation on Dee Dee, and Abraham has been officially reported missing. They came to Greg asking for help, and Greg reflects on everything, but he says it didn't take much time for him to make this decision. Abraham was his friend, and Abraham had helped him out tremendously in the past, so Greg agreed to help, and he actually came up with a plan himself. He cut the top off of a red bull can and put that can in his car cup holder. He put a small recording device in the can and was using the can as an ashtray. I guess it's something he actually does. He recorded a secret conversation with Dee Dee. Dee Dee tells Greg that a man named Ronald has probably killed Abraham and is threatening her life. Supposedly, Ronald is her drug dealer. Now, eventually, through conversation, her story changes, and eventually, she tells Greg that she needs to set someone else up for the murder. She needs a fall guy to go to prison for this. The investigators then send in an undercover officer who they want to act as the fall guy. This officer tells Dee Dee that he can take Abraham's body somewhere else, plant the evidence to make it look like he did it, and this can be done for $50,000. And for evidence... Greg needed Dee Dee to give him the murder weapon so it can be the evidence, and the cops also wanted Dee Dee to tell Greg where the body was buried. And she gives him the gun. So it seems like Dee Dee is not as smart as she thinks she is. But Greg does point out that at one point she was trying to figure out if he was wearing a wire. So she does suspect him at least a little bit. Abraham's remains would be found buried on the property of her new house. 
He had been shot in the chest, pushed into a hole dug in the yard, with fresh concrete poured over the hole. Dee Dee told the contractor that the concrete pad was a spot to park her boat. Before the concrete was laid, she had her ex-husband actually dig the hole, telling him that it was for hiding money. So Abraham was actually shot twice in the chest, with a weapon that was registered to Dee Dee, and she had actually purchased it from a local shop. She spent time on the firing range to practice her shooting skills. She tries to say that Ronald, the drug dealer, killed Abraham, but the cops know that that is a lie. She then tells the police that the person responsible for the murder is her own 14-year-old son, RJ. She's willing to let her 14-year-old son take the blame for this. But on December 10th, 2012, Dee Dee was found guilty of Abraham Shakespeare's murder and was sentenced to life in prison without parole by a judge who called her cold, cruel, and calculating. Of course, she claims it was a miscarriage of justice. She believes she's innocent and was only convicted because her lawyers screwed her. They didn't put forth the ample evidence that proves her innocence. And during interviews, she still says that she has evidence, real evidence, that proves that Ronald did it. But at the same time, she'll go back and forth between how she's speaking. She'll say, I don't really know who did it. If I knew, I would tell you. And then I believe that Ronald did it. So she's just making up stories. And she offers a deal to investigators. She will tell them who really killed Abraham if they will just allow her to keep the assets she took from Abraham because she claims she obtained those legally and she'd be allowed to keep them. Although we now know that she forged his name in order to take him off the account. So it seems to be that Dee Dee will never admit what she did and she will most likely just keep changing stories for the rest of her life. Uh, she knows who killed him. She doesn't know who killed him. Who knows? But I think we do know what really happened. And, um, you know, I try to stay biased about this sort of thing, but towards the end of this episode, it's kind of like, well, there's a lot of evidence there. So thank you for joining me today. This was a short episode. Next week, Stefan will be back full time, and we will see you then. Thanks. Thanks.